May I welcome all of you this evening's wonderful warm evening to LSO St. Luke's. My name is Martin Elliott. I'm the Provost of Gresham College and I have uh, the wonderful job of introducing tonight's speaker. Um, these annual Sir Thomas Gresham lectures have been going on for a long time and they've been given by leading figures from all walks of life. Um, covering a correspondingly wide range of subjects from um, human rights to black holes, from global hunger uh, to populism. Art and literature are fundamental to the human experience, adding meaning to our lives and uh, helping us better to understand ourselves and the world and, of course, giving us great pleasure. Uh, this is why we are so delighted uh, that tonight's speaker has accepted our invitation to deliver the annual Sir Thomas Gresham Lecture. Uh, the speaker is Professor Bernadine Avaristo, OBE, novelist, poet, critic, essayist, Booker Prize winner in 2019 for Girl, Woman, Other, academic and activist. Her books and writings have been widely lauded and extensively awarded, and I thought I might read everything out on her Wikipedia page, but um, I haven't got time. Um, but it is an enormous list of awards and wonderful. <clears throat> um, her works challenge conventional narratives and explore themes of multiculturalism, feminism, and social justice. Her books have been translated into 40 languages, and she passes on her uh, enormous skills as professor of creative writing at Brunel University. Now, in addition to her literary achievements, Bernadine is a strong advocate for diversity in the arts and co-founded the Brunel International African Poetry Prize, uh, which celebrates African poetry. She's been involved in various initiatives to promote underrepresented voices in literature, something she has continued to do as only the second woman um, to be president of the Royal Society of Literature. Now, before I finish my small introduction, you will find on your seats a uh, uh, a little brochure with a Slido code on it, a QR code. You can use your phones to pick up the QR code and that will allow you to ask questions from the audience. And if you're watching online, the same QR code is visible to you so that those questions can then appear magically on a tablet. I have to manage the questions at the end. Now, Bernadine's work continues to inspire and spark important conversations about race, gender, and representation in contemporary society. But like all great novelists, she is a consummate storyteller. And it's therefore with great pleasure that I invite Professor Bernadine Everesto to deliver the 2024 Sir Thomas Gresham Lecture, which she's titled, The Stories We Make Up and the Stories That Make Us. Please welcome Bernadine Everesto. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for coming to this event. And uh, I'm absolutely honoured and thrilled to be invited to deliver this annual lecture. I hope to make it interesting, at the very least. So um, I hope you enjoy it. <clears throat> I'm keenly interested in interrogating how stories shape our lives and the ways in which we ut utilize narratives to make sense of our experiences and the societies around us. Story is embedded in us from before we were born, rolling down the, high, the hills and valleys of millennia through our families, demographics, and geographical inheritances. The stories of our ancestors are transmitted through our evolving genes and intergenerational transference from parent to child. 
parent to child, parent to child, on and on backwards. We use story to preserve traditions and values, mirror and transform, convey cultures, and communicate religions through narrative texts, parables and fables, poems, psalms, songs, and sermons. Through story, we understand and process our personal identity, community, culture, nation, the world, the universe. So while we might think of stories <clears throat> as a conscious act of constructing narrative that is written down in books, explored through the arts, spoken word, oral history, and as separate to our daily lives, story really, stories really are a living organism inside of us and swirling in the air around us. We are stories. Stories are us. We breathe stories. We create stories. Stories are made up about us, and we leave stories behind when we've passed on. I recently gave a talk to a gathering of corporate woman le women leaders and was asked for advice by a chemist on how scientists can use storytelling to impart information about data. Of course, my mind went blank. What the hell do I know? I dropped science subjects at school as soon as they were no longer mandatory. In any case, as the audience waited with bated breath for my pearls of wisdom, I suggested she employ creative writers and wondered why they weren't doing this already. Lord knows most writers can do with the money, especially poets who are best equipped to deliver succinct, punchy copy and who can convey complex ideas through simple but memorable language that can be easily understood by everyone. Storytelling has long been used to disseminate information and market products. Why? Because dry facts, information, data, are less interesting unless attached to a narrative that features characters, whether real life people, fictional people, or animals or inanimate objects personified. Characters that engage not only our minds and imaginations, but our feelings. The emotional responses generated deep within ourselves that can be so, that can be so unignorable, they stir us to act on them. And if we can move people, we have a greater chance of getting them on our side or selling them something. How many times have we heard people praise a work of literature, a film, a song, because it brought them to tears? While politicians soon learn that they need to construct at best, fabricate at worst, persuasive narratives in order to attack the oppo, promote themselves, their parties, their policies, even their ideologies, if they have any. Some of the most influential and pernicious members of the political class understand how to play with people's emotions, which is why their rhetoric seduces people through accessing their emotions. They speak to people's hearts through creating an us versus them story that scapegoats others. The MO of demagogues, those bloviating, manipulative individuals with their man of the people, snake oil salesman, confidence trickster swagger, whose only interest is the one prefaced by the word self. And people fall for it. Logic, rationality, evidence to the contrary, be damned. Common sense, be gone. Character unsuitability, not an issue. Inexperience, who cares? Liar, criminal, rapist, racist, forgiven or written off as fake news. I'm also interested in how history is often presented as the unassailable truth of the past, rather than one version of it, chosen timelines, particular perspectives. I don't need to break down the word history into his story. The trailblazing feminists of the 60s and 70s began the process of scrutinizing language and how it perpetuates gender, ish, gender biases. Women, that pesky 50% or so of the human race, 
were primarily written out of history by those who devalued their contribution to uh, evolution and civilization. Attempts to redress this is an ongoing process with just a few millennia to catch up on, especially when up against a patriarchy so entrenched, feminists are still disparaged in the UK, in spite of it undergoing a fashionable moment a few years ago. Even the concept of the patriarchy, the very naming of it, is considered contentious. Whisper it or you'll get into trouble. While society has progressed for women over the centuries, creating a story where women are now equal to men is dangerous, not least because in many areas of society and of course so many parts of the world, there is little or no equality. In privileged Britain, the story still persists that women are less important than men in most arenas, including the arts, artists, film and television makers, theater makers, and women are still struggling for parity, equal opportunities, and recognition. Look at the stats on women theater directors, film directors, and playwrights for a start. Not long ago, I read a newspaper article about a high-profile woman who is a self-declared feminist. The columnist, herself female, expressed admiration for this woman because her feminism was quiet which I take to mean she wasn't banging dustbin lids while howling at midnight on the moors. The journalist compared this muted woman to another high-profile feminist who was anything but quiet about it. In her opinion, one was a good feminist, the other bad, because she spoke up. I know, go figure. The foot soldiers of the patriarchy Sometimes women are on a mission to trample feminism back into the ground. We see this writ large globally, countless stories from Roe versus Wade to women and girls in Afghanistan under the Taliban, once we abandon them to their inevitable fate. Women writers have our work cut out for us because statistically, we are most likely to write stories about women and there is a lot of ground to catch up. Still, the female imaginary, overflowing with infinite possibilities, is always, merely by producing work, destabilizing the concrete foundations of the temple of the patriarchate, run by the high priests who for centuries controlled and defined culture. Toni Morrison once said that definitions belong to the definer not the defined. She was an imaginative chronicler of African-American culture who inspired generations of writers around the world, including myself, her greatest fan. Morrison elevated her society through deep and complex fiction, a society that had been subject to a history of enslavement and segregation, police brutality, jurisdictional discrimination, lynching and mob violence, systemic persecution through social and economic policies, and stereotyping and caricature portrayals in the mass media. African-American artists are still having to negotiate the stories told about them, the demeaning and dishonest storification that lasted for centuries, the gangster trope, the sexual predator trope, the un uneducated baby mother trope, and so on. Similarly, in Britain, whether we articulate this or not, we scribes of the African diaspora are writing into a society where we have historically been either ignored, peripheralized, or defined by others, starting with the racist hierarchies that evolved to justify the transatlantic slave trade. In response, ever since the anti-slavery autobiographies of the formerly enslaved writers Olada Equiano and Ignatius Sancho were published in the 18th century in Britain where they lived, we writers and indeed all creatives have been exploring the multiplicity of who we are, historical, the contemporary, alternative realities, the fantastic, futuristic through multiple genres and art forms. Even today, 
criticism of the empire and slave trade is swiped away by those who call themselves patriots. As, to po as opposed to those whom they call, unbelievably for these more enlightened times, traitors. As if confronting our country's difficult history is a sign of disloyalty rather than a sign of maturity. This history wasn't even a footnote in my school history class, although I do come from deep history myself. I'm not sure how it is now. In my day, we tended to focus on royal timelines and could all proudly recite the names of the six wives of Henry VIII and what happened to them, but knew nothing about the great injustices of the past, such as the impoverished and downtrodden working classes in British history, that is, the majority class, referred to from the 19th century onwards as the great unwashed. There is currently, currently an important new initiative afoot to install a major memorial to the transatlantic slave trade at the Museum of London at Docklands. Imagine that there are over 800 public statues commemorating British history but no, no major statues to the victims of the slave trade. A successful international business enterprise that contributed enormously to British economic growth in the 18th and early 19th century, including the Industrial Revolution and involving, of course, financial institutions such as banks and insurance companies who profited hugely from their involvement and this economic boom in turn aided colonial expansion. There are six artists currently on the shortlist for the memorial who have all produced powerful designs. But my choice is a totemic sculpture called Nana Buluku, believed to be a mythic African queen and mother of all deceased people. It is by the Trinidadian British artist, Zach Ove. 11 meters tall and brightly colored, it is an extraordinary sculpture laden with African and Caribbean cultural and spiritual references. It is both historical, contemporary, and radiates futurism. I think it's astonishingly subversive in terms of what we expect from more traditional somber memorials that usually blend into an urban environment. It is so gorgeous flamboyant and carnivalesque, it has the potential to become a national landmark on the tourist map, drawing people from far and wide, including children. It celebrates, uplifts, and inspires in a way that will direct new conversations and stories about this slave trade. Not only what people endured, what was perpetrated, but the indomitable spirit of survival not only what was tragic and lost, but what can be reclaimed, which is the incredible diversity, fertility, and range of African and Caribbean cultures. Once people have been drawn to see this spectacular installation, they can visit the museum, which has a permanent exhibition to this slave trade. Nana Buluku is one example of how today's artists, so many of them now achieving great success, are, tra are transforming the story around who we are and where we came from with great flair, originality, and sophistication. When we construct new narratives, sometimes addressing tired old cliches, we are all, in a sense, revisionists, for the greater good when we've been defiled and defamed, prejudged due to stereotyping, and considered homogenous, losing not only our humanity, but also our individuality. Films make a profound global impact, endorsing, perpetuating social norms, politics, prejudice and prejudices, and values. I grew up watching films in the 70s where Arabs were portrayed as terrorists, with the exception of the film star Omar Sharif, a handsome playboy gambler in real life who tended to be cast as the exotic, enigmatic, smoldering Arab who was only slightly sleazy. An American scholar called Jack Shaheen published an excoriating 2006 book called Real, R-E-E-L, Bad Arabs, How Hollywood, Hollywood Vilifies a People. 
based on 30 years of research into the representation of Arabs on film from the early days of the late 19th century to 2000. Out of the 1,000 films he watched, he discovered that Arabs were portrayed negatively in 936 of them. This is news to us. It is shocking. But really, many of us have watched these films ever since we were children. When we dehumanize and demonize a people because of their culture, religion, ethnicity, whether Jewish, Asian, African, the indigenous people throughout the world, through the stories we communicate about them, we are shutting ourselves off from their relatability as human beings, desensitizing ourselves to their realities. We lose compassion for them, even when they are massacred in their thousands or millions, which is clearly morally wrong. When we reduce peoples, for example, 1.2 billion people on the African continent, to a few reductive and, quite frankly, ridiculous stereotypes and characteristics, we are stripping them of the complex layers of qualities we all share as human beings. I also wonder about the Hollywood story of the 574 remaining original indigenous American tribes in America. Well, do I really need to wonder? I grew up watching racist cowboy and Indian films told from the one-sided viewpoint of the heroic conqueror, with no idea as a child how heinous they really were. The hit 2023 film, Killers of the Flowers, Flower Moon, was a long time coming, and it was good to hear that the director, Martin Scorsese, worked closely with the Osage community in Oklahoma in order to be accurate get their side of the story, and to create genuine three-dimensional characters. A couple of months ago, I visited the Venice Biennale and encountered for the first time the work of the artist chosen to represent America, Jeffrey Gibson, who describes himself as a queer American member of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians of Cherokee descent. He is the first indigenous American artist to represent the US with a solo show 94 years after America first built its pavilion there. Two years ago, Sonia Boyce was the first black woman to represent the UK, and likewise, Simone Lee to represent the US. With these kinds of when these kinds of firsts come around in the 21st century, and they do quite a lot, don't they? Such as Rebecca Salter's appointment as the first woman president of the Royal Academy of Arts in 250 years, which then led to the first solo show in the main galleries by a woman, Marina Abramovich, retrospective, in 2023. We have reason, again, to be shocked or even my appointment, as already mentioned, as the second woman and first person of color to assume the presidency of the Royal Society of Literature in 200 years, and the first president who wasn't educated at Oxford, Cambridge, or Eton. I was accused of playing identity politics for noting this in public, as if it has no meaning, no relevance, as if we live in a merit meritocracy and gender, racialization, class, etc., are insignificant factors and no obstacle to success. Many august institutions of similar standing haven't even broken through these barriers. Maybe we'll have to wait another 200 years. Never mind, we are, if anything, patient. Too patient. We should stop being patient and make more demands. The firsts are always a jolt to the system, because we usually haven't registered their absence, and it needs to be drawn to our attention as a reminder that the road behind was unkind and the road ahead is long, winding, and rocky. Jeffrey Gibson's show, called The Space in Which to Place Me, featured large figurative sculptures, which reminded me of Simone Lee two years ago, with her monumental sculptures of black women. 
Gibson's work made a stunning visual impact with his installation of these sculptures, murals, flags, busts, paintings, and a video installation of an indigenous dancer performing the jingle dress dance to indigenous infused techno. He utilizes traditional beadwork with belts, bags, badges, knitting, and other objects and methods to create the most dazzling, bold, dramatic, and gorgeously colorful work, which is political, activist, and connects with intersecting protest movements such as civil and queer rights. He transformed the American pavilion, including the wall murals outside, an incredible spectacle, in passionate symbolic advocation of what he stands for, his communities and allegiances, and in refutation of the colonizers' stories about his country, his people, America, and the history of oppression that continues through to today. His installation embodied resilience and resistance, joy and celebration. Everywhere we turn, stories are being spun about who we are and how we live, how we should be seen and treated, what is expected of us, what's right, what rights we have, our roles. Let me now turn to the media, who, ever since the first weekly news sheets were sold in London in the 17th century, have been influencing public opinion through news stories that present a version of the world according to their owners, financiers, editors, journalists, audience, and to satisfy their constituencies. Who is worthy of column inches? Whose version of events is reported? What stories are omitted? What individuals and groups are regularly demonized? In one or two newspapers, sorry, no, um, for decades, the only prominent women in several newspapers were those who flashed their naked, braless boobs on the pages. Those who objected to this, oh, those small sport feminists again, were reduced to caricatures who, ironically, were ridiculed for not shaving their legs and not wearing, wait for it, bras. Yep, go figure. When the narrative around a particular section of society is perniciously stereotyped, then that becomes the truth about them in the wider sphere. In the past few years, trans people have been spoken about, defined and disparaged, but have rarely appeared in the media to tell their side of the story, speak up about their life experiences, offer their opinions, as varied, I am sure, as the cisgendered, who can blame them when they will risk a setup that disadvantages them in debate, as I have been told happens. I am a huge fan of the art of the non-binary South African visual activist Zaneli Moholi, whose photographic portraits and self-portraits and other artwork of black South African LGBTQIA plus people are currently on show at Tate Modern. The most striking thing about their substantial portraits of queer and trans people is that when I look at them, I don't really see gender, or rather, what I see is gender fluidity, which in turn starts to feel immaterial. Maholi has captured their humanity as human beings. We, subject and viewer, look at each other, human to human. It is a beautiful antidote. When negative stories are continuously pumped out about particular communities, in the absence of effective counteracting influences, the negativity is absorbed into the bloodstream, where they risk being distilled into where it risks being distilled into bigoted sentiments on a grand scale, the mass consciousness effectively brainwashed. Maholi's portraits challenges us to reframe the narrative. It is worrying that some people think their favored media outlets are proselytists of the gospel truth, when in reality there is no gospel truth. There are, as I said, versions and perspectives. And if we accept that there is no higher morality or integrity at work here, we will be more circumspect with our responses to the media we consume. As someone who has literally had words put into my mouth, I should know. On the more benign end of the scale, I've been misquoted in interviews where the consequences are not seriously damaging. 
On the more malign end, I've had individual words from a public quote I gave to a newspaper extracted from their original meaning and context and repositioned side by side in order to present a different meaning than my original intention. The journalist, employing a straw man argument, used it as a truncheon to beat me up. Heck, I'd beat myself up if I'd actually said what I was accused of saying. In another fabrication, I was presented as rep reprimanding another writer for something they said at a literary festival I appeared at, as if we were on stage together in disagreement. When I did not even attend his event, had no idea it was happening, had no idea what he'd said, and have never actually met him. My event with another writer later that day at the same festival involved a conversation in a different context. I am not used to these media misrepresentations of who I am and what I stand for, and it has made me feel more sympathy for public figures for whom one imagines this is a daily occurrence, and one imagines that in time they become immune to it. Social media, on the other hand, is an arena where people slug it out without the pretense of presenting balanced views. I'm interested in how it empowers people from historically cancelled communities who have found platforms to vociferously campaign for their causes and interests to affect change, and for a long time now, influence the media, or what some call the legacy media, consigning it unfairly and prematurely to the knacker's yard. Having a voice, presenting your own version of events, telling your story, rebutting false narratives is surely to be encouraged. But of course, all of these platforms can be problematic. And X, formerly Twitter, leads the charge. X is now in the throes of its difficult teenage years. It is no longer the innocent child it was in the early days when it was harmless, but it is not quite responsible as an adult. Now it has a billionaire, erratic and just plain weird role model of a parent, <laughs> one who is indulgent and indulged, latest bonus $56 billion, and it's got out of control. Safe to say that X isn't getting the best supervision. This teenager can be very disruptive, X, I mean, and encourages untrammeled social behavior such as tantrums, slanging matches, muck raking, mob rule, backstabbing, front stabbing, side stabbing, and it perpetuates false narratives again that circumnavigate the globe at the speed of light. Conversely, X also offers global connection, information dissemination, conversation, solidarity, campaigning, and even reasonable balanced discourse that can lead to collectivist action with real results in raising public awareness and accountability, such as through the Me Too and Black Lives Matter hashtags, neither of which I doubt would have kicked off if left to the traditional media. Millions of women telling their stories and offering support brought about the Me Too movement, like, likewise with Black Lives Matter. Yes, folks, the revolution is slowly being Twitterized. X can be infuriating and chaotic, uh, an infuriating and chaotic cacophony of too many people competing to be heard alongside the dreadful bots generated by the troll farms set up by at least 30 countries to date who are summoned into service as stealthy character assassins and the disseminators of false information. Meanwhile, otherwise placid and seemingly harmless people, when you meet them face to face, will metamorphose into monsters and skin you alive if they don't like what you say. And then, as if that's not enough, they'll dunk you in a bath of acid. Others will ruthlessly set you up as bait for their bloodthirsty follower predators, eager to pounce on their next victim, blood drooling from their jaws before the pack moves on. Popularity operates as the cultural capital of cyberspace, and some people will do anything to boost their numbers. That said, again, equally, it is a force for good if we use it judiciously and don't allow it to turn us all into junkies hooked up to a permanent heroin drip. 
While it's tempting to dismiss it as insignificant, peripheral, peripheral to real life, it is not. The tectonic plates of dissent are grinding away in the subsurface of social media, whether we are paying attention or not. Everyone's a storyteller battling it out to be the most heard, the most influential. And like the traditional structure of stories, there is plenty of drama, motivation, character flaws, conflict, obstacles, and innumerable plot twists. Of course, X isn't the only platform, but it seems to me to be the most effective in reaching wide audiences, and the stories that continue to define many of us are challenged and rewritten in this space. The stories everyone can freely refute that are designed to shut us up, keep us down in our place as lowly subalterns who accept our subservience as the natural order of things. As writers of fiction, unless we're going meta, we aim to present characters that feel real, even when they're fantasy characters or monsters. Our job is to persuade the reader that they are experiencing realness. We want our readers and audiences to believe in what we create, that there is a truth and authenticity to the narrative. We want our readers to imagine our characters really do exist. We want them to invest in the narrative trials we put our characters through and to be emotionally involved in them. Stories are also how we communicate interpersonally, the way in which we talk about ourselves, our relationships, how we create anecdotes, talk about other people, also known as gossiping, which gets an unfair bad press because surely it's simply one of the ways in which we learn about human psychology from childhood onwards. The Tory stories we tell ourselves or which we buy into will determine who we fall in love with, what kinds of people with whom we feel an affinity and who we allow into our social circles. The stories we believe about others influences where we position them in the hierarchy of, say, intelligence, authority, brilliance, beauty, and are they worthy of our respect? We are born into our parents' and guardians' stories and sometimes have to live with their prescriptions for our future. And when we don't, we might feel that we have freed ourselves. I was born into a culture of negative stories about what it means to be a person of color, a woman, working class. As a young woman, I became a storyteller, first through theater, then through writing books and other genres. I decided to self-determine my career and life in such a way that I would always be in charge of it as much as possible. I didn't consciously, at least, accept what people projected onto me, and writing was my way of rejecting the negative and opening myself up to creative exploration instead. As a result, I've never felt crushed by society at large, that, uh, from, uh, by a society at large that years ago regarded me, British born and raised, as not quite belonging. Over the years, I've come to appreciate that whatever stories are put out there to damage my communities, even myself, no matter how annoying and even destructive in intent, it all goes into my creative cauldron and I will one day metabolize it into fiction. I really should thank them for causing problems for me because without conflict, I would not be a writer. Today in Britain, in Britain, people of the African diaspora are writing more books, plays, screen drama than ever before in our history. It has been exhilarating to witness this, especially with so many new writers of all ages coming through and reaching wide audiences. Stories will always be part of human life, and it is essential that we create the space and support for those who present talented counter-narratives that challenge the orthodoxies imposed upon us and which aim to put us in boxes that limit our potential. Yeah.